Let's take our Bibles and turn to 2 Peter, right toward the end of the New Testament. 2 Peter chapter 3 is where we'll be today. Uh, we human beings have this strange relationship with time, don't we? Uh, usually it's we want more of it, uh, right? If only I had more time, had more time to finish the chores or uh, for your kids in school, finish my homework. Uh, the only time we don't want more time, it seems, is if we have to wait on something. And we want less time. Like, let's hurry. Let's get this done. Uh, we want less uh, time to go quicker. Uh, C.S. Lewis once wrote that the biggest way that the enemy deceives us is to tell us that if somehow we would worry, time would go faster. Uh, but actually... He says, time just keeps passing one second at a time, always. And that's something we just have to learn to live with. I think that's right. I think it's difficult, though. The the big warning you get, you know, in in ministry and anywhere else is never pray for patience. You ever hear that? You probably grew up hearing that. Don't pray for patience because if you pray for patience, man, your patience will get tested. Well, I, I don't know if that's true or not. But here's what I'm learning to pray for instead of patience. I'm learning to pray for trust, that I will learn to trust, that I'll trust more. If I find if I'm just concentrating on trusting God more, then the patience will come. Uh, if I do pray for patience, sometimes I get distracted on how long I have to wait. <laughs> and it aggravates me and it makes me more impatient. But if I pray, God, let me trust you more. Help me to trust you completely. Then somehow as I'm in the middle of learning to trust God, to trust God's timing, to trust God's mercy, to trust God's grace and love, then somehow I'm learning more patience along the way. I find I look up and go, wow, I was more patient there than I usually am because I'm learning to trust God's timing. And I think that the toughest struggles we get into have to do with timing. Right. Uh, Either not trusting God's timing, being impatient, acting impatiently, which I'm good at that. I'm good at acting impatient. I'm I'm good at patience is just not my thing. I mean, it's a lifelong journey. But, uh, you know, I'm the kid who wants to peek under the tree. I want to tear the package a little bit and see 10 days before Christmas, not Christmas. I think my sons inherited that from <laughs> from me. Uh, we we had to be very creative in hiding our packages from our kids when they were little, and I don't know if they've gotten any better at that uh, as they've gotten older. But and I don't know if I have either. But what I am learning to pray for is trust. And here in Second Peter, you have this letter to a struggling church that is uh, beset, you know, that is being attacked in some ways, and. It, they're either being attacked or they're being influenced by negative things. Mostly by people who are kind of scoffing at them as they continue to develop. They're saying, where's this Jesus that you keep saying is going to come back? Where is he now? We don't see him. How come you say that not only have you seen him and experienced him, but he's coming back and he's going to set everything right? Where is he? We are waiting uh, time is up, and many in the church were beginning to feel this anxiety as well. Many of them thought he was just going to come back right away, like very quickly. Now, we're thankful that, you know, he has delayed because we benefit from that, uh, but they were wrestling with that a little bit, especially because things were getting tougher, right? Again, it's that uh, when things get tougher, we want time to go quicker, right? Less time. Uh, when things are going fine, give me more time. You know what I mean? I mean, make Saturdays and Sundays last longer. You know, let, make the weekend go longer and make the weekday shorter. That would be great. Uh, that's what they're feeling. They're feeling. They're in the middle of Wednesday, man. They're in the middle of the weekday, and they're they're feeling that as a church, and they're saying, God. Uh, help we're getting impatient here what's going on and they're complaining even to their pastors to their leaders 
Where is this Jesus? I mean, we love him, we trust him, but where is he? He needs to come back now. Things are really going badly now. We're getting persecuted. We're, things are happening around us that we don't like. Now would be great. I remember praying that during an algebra exam. Anyway, uh, yeah, now Lord would be great, you know, if he could just. But but God is to, for them, and nor did he for me in that algebra exam. Uh, God is not answering that prayer right now, at least in the way they see fit. So Peter, inspired by God's spirit, writes this to them. Here you go. Verse eight. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire in the earth, and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt with heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So what can we do in this sort of in-between time, this impatient time where we sometimes find ourselves saying, like this church was saying, hurry up, God, (laughs) please, now would be good. Well, I think the first thing that helps us is to remember that God does have a purpose in all this. I'm not saying God zaps us and God doesn't cause the trouble in our world. I don't believe that at all. I believe we cause enough of our own trouble. God doesn't do that. But what I do believe is this, that God has an ultimate purpose for his people. And that God will work through even the disasters, even the difficulties, to bring about some good for those of us who will trust him and recognize that he's got a purpose. Two of the voices, the kinds of voices that the early church were wrestling with, are kind of the voices we wrestle with today. But they were in full swing back then in the first century. One was called the Stoics. And you, you know that expression, Stoicism, is what the, we've come to know it as people who just you know, that seem to never flinch. They're always just sort of uh, very somber. And they go, well, that's sort of the popular version, but it actually comes from a philosophy that was around about the 3rd century B.C. It's been around a while. And it was this group that said basically everything's just tied to nature And we really, nothing, everything's kind of out of our control and whatever nature does, we're just subject to it. So you might as well just have a stiff upper lip and endure it and just recognize that if you're, if if you'll just get in line with the fact that we're all just kind of bound for destruction, just like nature, then you'll be okay. That's a fun way to live, isn't it? And they were very somber people and they would mock those who tried anything different to sort of overcome that. Yeah. I mean, they would hate technology. <laughs> I mean, technology would be just, for Stoics, would be just bad. You know, just like, what are you doing? All you're doing, they would say, I mean, they wouldn't say it back then, I'm just using this expression, all you're doing is rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. You know what I mean? All that technology, because it's all going down anyway, so you might as well just hang on for the ride and go down singing. You know, uh, Negative, right? The second group was even worse. You think that's bad. The second group were called the cynics. And you've heard that expression too. Cynic, someone is cynical. That means they just have no hope. They're always down or party. They're always no good. That group came around about the same time. Whew, that was a fun era, wasn't it? You had the Stoics developing and the cynics developing. And man, by the time the first century AD comes around, these folks were in full swing as well. There were little clusters of cynics all over that sort of scattered around the countryside. And they'd go around and just do whatever they could to survive and basically just sit around and tell each other how bad things are and how bad they're going to be. Whew, that was a fun party, wasn't it? And they would just remind people that things are getting worse and worse and worse. And they're going to keep getting worse. 
And the quicker you get in line with the fact that it's just not going to go well, the more at peace you'll be. I know, I'm depressed just even thinking that way. But I, I, and maybe you are too. So the church, among the many other persecutions it was going through, this was right smack dab in the middle of a growing group of Stoics and a growing group of Cynics, some of whom were infiltrating the church, saying, why in the world did we ever believe that God would bring all this together for good when nature tells us that it's just going to peter away and we're going to be a part of it, so we might as well just embrace that. Yeah, that, that didn't help church attendance very much, you know what I mean? That, that wasn't very encouraging to the body of Christ because many got caught up in that thinking. So Peter writes this in response to them to say, hey, don't forget, we don't, we're not just the subjects of whatever happens in nature. We serve a God who created nature and who has a purpose for it. Isn't it funny what happens when you add purpose to anything? I mean, you can go out and chip rocks all day and uh, be more discouraged than when you started and more tired. But if you know that I'm chipping this rock away so that we can use it to build an orphanage, purpose, right? You've just injected purpose into this seemingly very mundane task. And it makes all the difference in the world. So just like us, the people in the first century got up, got dressed, ate their breakfast maybe, went to work, went about their daily lives, took care of their families as best they could, over and over. And if many of them who were caught up in this stoic way of thinking, like, it's just a cycle, it's just going to repeat anyway, it really doesn't matter, we're getting more and more discouraged. And those who were cynics saying, not only is it just repeating, it's getting worse, it's downward spiral. It, it, no matter what I do, it's just getting worse and worse. The Titanic is sinking. Into that, Peter injects this reminder for the people of God. You and I are people who are doing these things, yes, these everyday mundane things, but we are, we are actually spiraling upward toward God's purposes. Amen? Isn't that better? I mean, it, and it happens to be true, but it also happens to be really good. That there are these things that beset us, that hold us back, that stop us for a while, that even harm us at times, hurt us. But somehow in the middle of all that, we get to be people of purpose because we, are, we have attached ourselves, or God has attached us, to this kingdom that will never end. That has defeated sin and that has defeated death. And that forever we'll get to rejoice in the goodness and mercy and grace of God. That's better. Right? That, that puts a little more purpose, a lot more purpose, into a Monday. Right? Or to a Wednesday. Or to just a normal daily day. Oh, and by the way, Peter says, not only is that purpose happening now, but in the long run, it's even better. Because Jesus, this Jesus you're waiting on, although it seems like it's a long time, God is not worried about how long it's taking because God's purposes are being worked out during this time. And when he does arrive, everything will be set right once and for all. Right? That injects a deep breath of relief into a very negative world. And guess what? That's what we're about. Few or many, that's what the church is about. We inject purpose. That's why the ice cream was fun yesterday. I mean, it was hard. It was, we were hot. Uh, you know, the 24 or 5 or so people we got to hand out ice cream to, we injected some good into a very hot, humid world. I mean, I think it's a great symbol of what the church does all over the world every day. The people of God. We're that Blue Bell ice cream. We're, we're, we're the Blue Bell ice cream in this very dark, dingy, tasteless world. That's what we get to be a part of. How, how does that change the way I get up on Monday or you get up on Monday? Well, I think it should. I get up on Mondays getting to know that you and I get to be the Blue Bell in this dingy, tasteless world. 
we get to be that touch of grace that God is not only working with and in, he's working with and in us, but he's working through us as well to accomplish his purpose, to bring hope, to bring joy, and to bring peace in the world. Hey, the Stoics are wrong. The cynics are wrong. We're not just spiraling into some pattern. We are a part of a God's of, of, of God's kingdom and of God's purposes in the world. What a blessing that it can be if we allow it to be that. We're purpose-filled. God is at work. God is working with us. God is working for us. And God is working through us. Final thing I get is this. Not only is God working with a purpose in us and through us so that we don't have to be you know, hopeless, down all the time. But secondly, God always finds ways to bring order out of chaos. That's how the whole story starts in Genesis, right? Everything was formless, orderless, and God starts putting things in order. Every single time things look like they're completely out of order, and you follow it through the Old Testament, the people of Israel, there are times where they are scattered, they are discouraged, they're enslaved, they're at their lowest point, God begins to put the pieces back together. Right? And the Bible also says that at just the right time, it's like when we needed him most, God sent his son right, into the world. Now again, chronologically speaking, for some it seemed like this is, this is taking a long time. Right? But there's another word for time in the Bible. Chronos is one word. It's where we get chronology. That's a Greek word, chronos. It's like tick-tock, tick right? It's, it's ordered time, right? It's just time like we know time, like that clock ticking. But there's another word for time in the Bible, and it's kairos, K-A-I-R-O-S in the English, but kairos. Kairos means something like this, purposeful time. And, and why is that important? Well, most of the time... When God talks about time, he uses kairos. The Bible uses kairos, purposeful time. At just the right kairos, at just this right opportunity, just the right moment. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us that, number one, God doesn't measure time like we do, which Peter just reminded us. Like God, God's not worried about, you know, your watch or my watch or what, you know. He's not, God doesn't work on that kind of scale. God works on purposeful time which means God looks for opportunities to bring order out of chaos. about that? It's as if God sees things beginning to stir and move and says, okay, it's time. Okay, it's time. Okay, it's time. See what I mean? It's a different way of measuring time. And Peter's reminding the church, look, God is not slow in keeping his promises as some understand slowness to be. Why? Because we understand slowest with chronos, like tick-tock, tick-tock, tick. Come on, God. Right? Instead, God is working, Peter says, with a purpose, kairos, purposeful time. And for, so for the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day. I mean, God's not like, tick you know, he's not looking at his watch. God is instead going, here is the direction my kingdom needs to go to fulfill my purposes. And I will step in and continue to bring order from the chaos. I love that. It gives me peace when I am standing in long lines. You do that? I have this gift, guys. I have to confess. I mean, and God blesses us all with certain gifts, and I'm thankful for the gifts he's given, all of us, me included. I mean, somehow music always came easy to me. Somehow language always came easy to me. Uh, somehow even playing first base in baseball actually came pretty easy to me. So those are some gifts that I think God has given me. I'm thankful for that. I really am. But here's my greatest spiritual gift, I'm convinced. Finding the longest line. There it is. I don't know if that's mentioned in the Bible anywhere. I've never found it. But I'm pretty convinced it's a gift that I possess. And I say that to warn you, if you're ever in the store with me, <laughs> No matter how short the line looks that I'm in, pick the other one. Because mine is going to take longer than the other ones. It's just my gift. I just somehow know how to pick them. 
I've tried it both ways. I've stood in the longer line just to see if I'm right. And, of course, it takes twice as long as I think. I've stood in many shorter I've gone seven people there, three people there. My math is not great, but I know that that's better. Right? So I'm the fourth person in line, and by the time I get checked out, the tenth person in the seventh person line is already done. It's just my gift. I'm good at it. I know it's going to happen. I used to get frustrated about it. I really would. I mean, I'd get right there going, oh my gosh, I'm actually going to get out of here at a decent time. And, the, and I, you hear those magic words, price check, please. <laughs> no manager in sight. No, I, and I'm just, we're just going to stand here for a while. And meanwhile, one person after the other, it's almost like they're mocking me. They're just saying, yeah, you thought you could pick the shortest line, but we're out of here, sucker. You're staying. And so that, that's just my life. I don't know if you can relate, but that's my gift. Anyway, here's what I'm learning about God bringing order out of chaos and God having a purpose. I, instead of being as impatient as I used to be, there's two things that God is teaching me to do. Laugh and look when I'm in that line. Because I'm, tell, I'm telling you, there are skeptics who have doubted me. Even my own lovely, beautiful wife has doubted me. And I'll go, okay, try it. Stand in line. You stand over there, and I'll stand here. You stand in the longer line. And by the end of the time, most of the time, she's waiting for me at the door. All checked out. I'm like, see? And she got to the point where she's like, what do you do? What? <laughs> Do you talk to people? I mean, is it, no, honey, I'm quiet. I stand straight up. I wait. I, I look straight at it. I'm just, let's get out of here. And it never happens. Okay, here's what I've learned. Laugh a little bit about it and look. Look for what? Look for God bringing some kind of order out of chaos. And let me tell you my best long line story. I've got several now. But I'm only going to tell you one. I'm only going to tell you one good one. Happened to me in Walmart. I'm in the short line. But part of me is thinking, Charles, you have this gift. <laughs> so don't get too impatient. And people are just trucking through that other line like they're on fire. You know, they're just going, and I'm just moving like molasses. And price check, and check cashing, and somebody's card won't go through, and I'm just... Lord Jesus, please help me. You know, I'm not, I'm trying to smile, you know, laugh, smile about it. I'm laughing about it. Someone taps me on the shoulder in this particular instance of my, using my spiritual gift of long lines. And I'm like, Lord, you, this is not great timing. Because, <laughs> you know, I'm not feeling happy here right now. So I turned around. And the woman goes, <clears throat> you're that preacher who lives over on Rosewood. Yes, ma'am. And I turned back around. <laughs> I know it's rude, but I'm just like, please, Lord, get me through this line. This is never going to happen. And she taps me again. And I'm like, yes, ma'am. Uh, and she goes, I used to be your post person, your mail person. Like, delivered your mail to you. Oh, hey, great. Thanks. I'm thinking, please, God, <laughs> get me through this one. And she said, now that it gets a little more serious, she said, you know, my son uh, was about your son's age, and he passed away about a year ago. Okay, well, now I, now God is like, okay, drop your attitude, Charles. It's time to, you know, right, and stop. So I'm like, man, I'm sorry. I, I think I heard that story and I didn't realize that was your son. And she kind of gets a little emotional in line. Of course, it had been about a year or so. And she said it was so hard, but she said, uh, you know, so many people in this community prayed for me and prayed for us. Uh, she, and she just started telling me, you know, the situation and, and the story about her son. I won't go into all that detail, of course, but the Holy Spirit went Forget about the line. Clear as I'm talking to you. So I said, man, 
it looks like you're, you're kind of hurting today. Is this, is this a particularly hard day for you? She said, well, you know, it's been a year. But she said, it's just been a year, just last week. It's a hard anniversary for me. She said, I'm not delivering mail anymore. I'm doing something else. But, you know, I kind of miss the people I'd see on the route. And, uh, I said, I understand. Can, can I pray with you? And she said, well, the line. I said, it ain't going anywhere. <laughs> That's not in it. I didn't say that part. But I, I said, well, let's step, you know, which is the last thing I want to can we step out of line and just step over there and just let me pray with you? She said, I'd love that. She said, you know, I'd love that. She said, I've been needing that. And I, I've been too afraid to ask people to pray with me. I said, well, let, let's just pray. So I would walk over and I just put my hand on her shoulder and we pray. We pray for God's peace. We pray for God's provision in her life. We pray for strength in her day, and for her week, and for her journey. And God took that long, ridiculous wait, that, that chaotic time where everybody in front of me it seems was having chaos with their card or with their pricing or with the wrong thing won't skew or what. And God took that chaotic moment and moved it and brought order In her day and mine. Um, that's just one of several weird stories I could tell you about this spiritual gift of long lines. And I'm still impatient, I'll confess that. But what God is teaching me is kind of what Peter is trying to teach the church is that. God has this purpose, and if we'll learn to trust his purpose, even in the midst of our impatience, he can bring order of some sort in the middle of the chaos. So I don't know about you, but I, I, wanna, I want him to keep doing that for me and for you, and for the people that God wants to bless through us. You might need this message this week. <laughs> I have a feeling I'm going to. <laughs> so, I, I think you might as well. And if you do, just remember, God has a purpose. And God likes to bring order out of chaotic times. He'll do it when we trust him. Let's stand together.